Yeah. What was that? What was that scotch that Doc John liked so much? Hoity toity, oh. expensive. I don't know, but I didn't care for it. I liked. And that's like uh, Sally bought us a bottle of uh, Lennon Fittich Sherry Cask. Oh, I remember that, yeah. And it was so sweet. Woo, it was sugar. Right, you know. I threw away the cork and said, let's drink it all now because it cost <laughs> too much to pour out. But I don't think I could do this again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was horrible. Well, I liked Cutty Sark because it was like a bourbon. It had a harsh taste. Oh, it's got a harsh taste. I've seen kerosene that was more refined. <laughs> Now, now, it was not that bad. It did have a good bite to it, and I liked that. Hope likes the cheap stuff as well, so it wasn't we had an unrefined palate, but just we knew what we liked to drink. Oh, yeah. So you went with that. And if, you, if you know what you like, and you don't abuse it, you actually enjoy it, then that is the correct whiskey for you. Yes. But uh, that's some pretty good little thing there. Now, that on the end in the Marine Corps bottle, that was for Steve. Mm -hmm. That's a really good bourbon, a smooth bourbon. Uh, now, this, this bookshelf here is military history in the top right corner. Well, it's, it's the majority of it is on the Marine Corps. Uh -huh. And there's a few books that I call generic history because you take like World War II, mm -hmm. it has Marines and Army mm -hmm. or uh, the American soldier, Marines and Army, soldiers like mm -hmm. that. Pacific Warriors, that's Marine Corps, but it's mainly Marine Corps all the way through. Mm -hmm. And you got your flat horns up there. Did you make yeah. those or did you buy those? I bought those. One's with the turkeys, his hands horn, mm -hmm. and uh, the one over here with the wolf is my horn, mm -hmm. and then I've got one or two I made. I've got one in my dueling set there. Mm -hmm. It's a flat horn, mm -hmm. and I made it, took the, the horn, got it down to almost polish, boiled it, and put it between uh, mm -hmm. some boards and... Mm -hmm. Uh, Got it good and soft and flattened it. Actually, it's like gourds. I used to have a gourd. I don't know if you remember it. It was rounded on the ends, but it was square. It was a drinking gourd, and I had grown it in a box, a wooden uh -huh. box, and uh, cut it up. Cause I grew up with drinking gourds mm -hmm. at our house. They were, mm -hmm. they were there, and, and uh, I remember the dippers. That's what I'm talking about. You, but I mean, we had an indoor door. sink, but hanging up over here at the side was a dipper. Right. They eventually, I'm sure, the family got metal dippers. It, it, this, was, this wasn't metal, but I know what you're right. talking about, wooden gourd. Yeah, we had, had gourd dippers. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were beautiful because some of the servants at my grandfather McGowan's house, they'd sit around and, and carve designs on them and what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when you find a lot of that stuff. It was a daily use common item. Mm -hmm. This wasn't some rich cats. It was a daily use item, but they would they had the skill, and they hated to do nothing. They'd sit there and they'd carve, they'd whittle, they'd inscribe, they'd sew, they'd whatever. They, I can't ever remember my grandmother ever just sitting unless it was at a funeral or something. I know they were always embroidery. Stitching. Constantly on the move. Yeah. My uh, grandfather McGowan and grandfather, my grandmother McGowan were very proper. And granddaddy McGowan would sit in his room and he would tie a white shirt and a vest. And if any woman came in that room other than Aunt Agnes who took care of him, mm -hmm. he immediately stood up and put on his coat. Mm -hmm. That was the manners that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And grandmother, 
never called my grandfather by his given name in public. She referred to him as Mr. John or Mr. McGowan. Mm -hmm. At the house, he was Johnny, mm -hmm. but that wasn't public. But uh, uh, I can remember great aunts that, like you're talking about in public, it, she would say, my husband, or she'd say, Mr. such and such. Right. In private, she called him father. Yeah. You know, he called her mother. You know, because he, she, he was the father of her children, and she was the mother of his children. But right. That, that was, was in the, our house too. That was the private name that they used together. So. Grandmother always wore sleeves that came below her elbows. Yeah. Both my grandmothers. Yeah. And you'd hold the door for for the ladies. You tip oh, your hat. Yeah. Stuff like that. I'm just in the, the, the tail endings of that because so many people were so old when I was learning. And it was, I remember they made fun of me in school because I'd do that. I'd been taught you're supposed to stand up when the lady walks in the room. Yes, sir. And here we were in school and the teacher walk in the room, I'd stand up. And she'd, you don't stand up, you stay in desk, but you're supposed to stand up when the women walk in the room. Yep, and they think it was funny like and quaint, so... I know now that it's a no-no, yeah. but we call most blacks uncle uh -huh. or Annie, mm -hmm. but God give my butt hell if my grandparents found out, or my mother and daddy, that I did not open the door for a black lady at the market. Oh yeah. And let me tell you, when you live in a small town of 3,000 people, which was a big town then. Word got around. It would be around real fast. Yes. You better have manners. You better help these ladies. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And, uh... There was a... Black for members of our family, when Ann and I got married, her family servants and my family servants were both at the, uh -huh. at the ceremony. And the same way with funerals. Yes. And they sat with family, because they were family. Yes. Those days are gone forever. Well, I can remember when, because uh, I was at the junction point of the black community and the white community. I was literally the last block. And there was a, a black lady coming up from town, and she had a couple bags of groceries. And about the time she got just past our house, that bag split and potatoes and stuff she had in that bag hit the deck. And my granny made me run to the kitchen to get two sacks, take, go out there and help that lady get it out of the road before a car got coming down the road and run over her stuff. And didn't know her, didn't know her from Adam's house cat, but it was the fact that she was in trouble and you will by God get up and do something. That's right. You know? During World War II, when school let out at 2.30 in the afternoon, one of the seniors worked down at the depot and he'd go down and he'd get his little uh, bag for telegrams right. and his little hat that said Western Union and get on a green bicycle and he'd ride through town. And in the afternoon, my black aunts and my white aunts and my grandmother would all go to the front of the house. Mm -hmm. And that was if he stopped at our house. Mm -hmm. And when he didn't, you could hear a sigh of relief. And then if he stopped at a neighbor's, that meant that somebody was wounded or dead. Or dead. Yeah. And the family had run to the kitchen and get half of our supper. Mm -hmm. And one of my black aunts would put on a clean apron, and one of my white aunts, the mother, mm -hmm. would put on a clean apron and take our supper up a hill. And the reason a black aunt went is because that family had black family and you did not know if a person hurt was black or white. Yeah. But they were family. They were family. Those days are gone. Yeah. And, and didn't you tell me at one time, I may be wrong, but you see it in the movie We Were Soldiers. And I remember, you know, the guy that wrote the book. Yeah. And, uh, but in that, they would come... You know, they were on that base, and the, the, the taxi would come around trying to find the address. Oh, yeah. And uh, in the movie, you see the, 
the wife of the the guy in it, which is Mel Gibson character. And the guy came up and asked her what the address, find, trying to find the address, and it scared her so damn bad. And so she went to the commander and said, you'll give me this. Was that Ann that did that? Well, what had happened, uh -huh. actually, because I read the book, too, yeah. is a taxi driver who was about three sheets in the wind mm -hmm. called on this girl to tell her her husband was dead and she was Hispanic and did not speak good English mm -hmm. and he made a pass at her and it scared hell out of her. Mm -hmm. And of course that brigade had a women's organization, a wives organization. Right. So the commanding officer of the brigade's wife and the executive officer went to the commanding general mm -hmm. and demanded a car and a chaplain and they would make all the house calls yeah. and did from mm -hmm. then on. Uh, but that came from World War II and there was no military to make the house calls. Mm -hmm. It was just in our town a bicycle. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in Cincinnati a car, mm -hmm. you know. but. Uh, my grandmother told me about that, like you're talking about, it was once a day that whoever would come out, because that's whenever the, 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 they would send all the telegrams. Well, the Hummingbird came through. Mm -hmm. That was a train that went from mm -hmm. Nashville to uh, New Orleans, uh -huh. and uh, it would drop off the mail, and then all the telegrams would come in about the time the Hummingbird went through in the afternoon. So the youngster would go down and pick up those, and of course word would be all over town in an hour that so and so was injured or so and so was dead. See, my my grandfather the Orsi, who was a captain mm -hmm. in the First Alabama Cavalry mm -hmm. during World War One, mm -hmm. uh, he was sort of a a wheel mm -hmm. like that. Isn't that pretty? It's just you know, been boiled and flattened to make a very, and then this would fit against you and, and bow right. out away from you. That was called a hunting horn, because to go out hunting during the day, you only needed two or three loads. Yeah, at most. Right. I always wanted a flat horn, I just never got yeah. one. I have a picture over there of Ann holding up the last turkey she killed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a 10 2010. The beard was over 10 inches long, mm -hmm. the bird weighed over uh, 20 pounds, and the spurs were over 10 inches long. Wow. I think that one says Grouch, his horn. Yes, Sir, no, it's Sir Francis McGowan, his horn, and you got the dog tracks on it, the wolf, like that. Mm -hmm. I've got that was a, my pistol horn. I got my scrimshot horn. Uh, there was a event up at Independence and they were going to have a handle match for throwing tomahawks. And I had never been part of such a thing. And old Dalton, not Dalton, Donnie, remember Donnie and his mama? Yeah. Well, he, Very well. he uh, was the officiator of that. And I'd come up and there was a guy that, I won't call his name, but he was a real arrogant pain in the butt. And he had a real, remember when the hawking shop made that fancy presentation hawks? I got one over there. Yeah, I mean that curly maple handle and it was... $45. That was big money back then. Yeah, because you could buy a hawk for 18 on the line. Yeah. And... Uh, they were doing handle matches, and I went to get in, and he said, well, if you're going to get in, you got to put your handle crossways. And so they all threw, and the next three that threw stuck in my damn handle and didn't fall. And that was that handmade head I had. And it came down to a match, to make a long story short, and it got down there to the end, and my handle had split 40 ways to Sunday. It was like a banana peel, but it all held together. So if you leaned it back, the pieces would kind of line up and you could throw it. But it, it's always going to crack out. And he got arrogant. 
and he said and he threw his and it stuck and he said and jobbed his finger in my chest and said and the best man win well I lined up and I threw that damn thing just as hard as I could it's gonna come apart or whatever and it hit the back of his damn eye and split the damn eye and the damn ham split and fell out of it and that guy cried he picked that get that damn thing up and cried and old Donnie um, looked around and proclaimed me the winner and that's how I got that scrim shot home because the winner got a scrim shot horn they'd scrim shot for you and so I then had never even planned I had to come up with what the hell I wanted on a horn yeah. <laughs> you know you know when I got up that morning I didn't know I was going to be doing this so I suddenly had to I come up with a map and for things down here had Fort Toulouse and stuff on it and you put Blackie Thomas his horn well when I was teaching hawk throwing one of the things I used to do to show off, and I know you remember it, I'd throw two hawks at one time. Yes. And cut the corners of the card mm -hmm. at an angle. Top corner, bottom corner. Mm -hmm. Well, I had, when I moved here, I set a hawk block up out back. Right. And I got a bucket full of hawks. And sat there and practiced. And I'd walk out there and practice. Over and over and over. And then when you walked up there and said, oh, just let me have these two here and pick them up and walked up there, they was hawks that I'd thrown a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Anytime it looks easy, you've done it a lot. That's what it is. Looking. That's a good looking little Peterson you got there. Thank you. Really is. Had that in for about 10 or 12 years. Yep. I guess this is called an umpaw. Really like it. Mm -hmm. Well, that apple you gave me that came, that was an alpha that came out of Israel. Mm -hmm. the, the tip finally split. Doesn't matter, I still smoke it. I've got an address that you can send it off and get it re-stemmed. Oh, heck no, that ain't leaving my possession. Oh, Forget yeah. It. Yeah, you can do I, that. There, there are nights, brother, that I pour me a wee dram of my stuff. And I sit and think about all the times that we were on the creek and stuff and I smoked that pipe. That's my memory to you. It ain't leaving me. Hell well, no. It cracked because you bit down on that sucker at some point and cracked it. Oh yeah. I, I have gotten to take my pipe out of my mouth and shoot it, turkey, uh -huh. uh, what have you, and bite a hole through my stem and <laughs> send it off. And yeah. They were $10, they are now about 15 a piece. Oh, yeah. With shipping, and they've re stemmed a lot of my pipes through the oh, years because yeah. I tend to get careless. Well, I've recently had change because there's a, there's a place there in Birmingham that Doc John turned me on to called the Briary. Yeah. They would do custom pipe blending. Mm -hmm. I used to go there. And uh, you used to smoke Borkham Riff. Still do. Still, I haven't seen it in years. I order mine from the pipe shop. Mm. In fact, I'm going to order probably this afternoon, and I order four cans at a time. Okay. Well, how much is a can? Well, <clears throat> it variates on shipping. Uh -huh. The low that I paid for this year is $28 a can. Mm. The high I paid is about $32. Mm. And I buy four cans a month. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm saying that is I, I'd like to try it again. Because I, I tried it yeah. with you years ago, and now I can't find it local. Right. I drink bourbon, uh, uh, Bokum Rift bourbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the aromatic flavor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not too harsh for my wife in the room. Mm -hmm. It's pleasant for everybody around you, but at the same time, yeah, because at one time I smoked Ranger, and it'd make everybody get up and leave because their <laughs> eyes were water. Yeah. Well, I had got to working with the Briary, and I had figured out that I liked Latake and Perique, and we worked up a custom blend called Devil's Plaything. And uh, I got uh, four ounces of it and tried it out for a while and said, yes, that's it, so they recorded it down. And then I called them up and I said, I'll be coming up uh, in about three weeks up there and I'd like to make a purchase. He said, okay, how much would you like? I said, two pounds. Because I don't go up there, you know. 
Well, that two pounds lasted me for about eight years. Yeah. And back in January, right after New Year's, is when I finally finished it up. And so I tried to get a hold of Briary, and I think they're out of business now. That happens. It does, you know. And so I went to my local uh, place down there in Dothan that's got a pipe shop. And we kind of started playing with it from scratch up, and uh, he brought out some stuff. I had just just palm full left to dregs. And the guy down there is a good tobaccoist. He was able to pick it apart and look at it. And he said, this reminds me a lot of this stuff called black duck. Let me dig that out. So I got black duck and I smoked it. And it was about 85%. It was close enough. That was a harsh tobacco. I like harsh scotches. And, key in it. Yeah. yeah, I like harsh scotches and I like harsh bourbons and I like harsh tobacco. And uh, so... I asked him about it, and so we got Black Duck, and we took that, and then we started working out the recipe. And so he made me uh, some, it's awful close to my, what I call devil's play thing. I tried some custom blends, because uh -huh. I was at a pipe and tobacco shop in mm -hmm. Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, mm -hmm. working my way through, and I found out that I could get the same thing that I desired out of a commercial blend. Mm -hmm. And that's when I settled on Bochum Riff. Mm -hmm. I smoked others. They used to make a tobacco, might still do, mm -hmm. called Greenbrier, mm -hmm. that was menthol. I when you had a bad yet. cold or whatever. You. Clear your lungs out. Yeah. Right. But, uh, the, of course, the only time I ever smoked it is when I had a bad cold. But now you take like in Vietnam, I had a pipe, chewed on it all the time. You used to like them damn little green ass cigars. Yeah. Good God. But I chewed them. God Almighty. Right. I it remember caused, you, you gave got, one to Doc John and he damn near puked. Well, and now uh, <laughs> we got what was in a box called SB. Uh huh. And it had razor blades, shaving cream, uh -huh. soap. Pipe tobacco, uh -huh. chewing tobacco. So you had to go with what you got. Yeah. And that was when I sort of developed a taste for it. For one thing, in pipe tobacco, all they had in there was cherry blend, which is very aromatic. Mm -hmm. It would get your ass killed in the jungle. So I just quit smoking my pipe and chewed on it. Mm -hmm. I quit smoking cigars and chewed on them. Mm -hmm. That's well, a uh, hog's tusk. Yeah, boar tusk. It's a nice one. I picked that up in Africa when I was there. Mm -hmm. That is nice. Well, the, uh, we had my event, we got around the fire, and I was smoking my pipe, and a bunch of people wouldn't know what I was smoking. And I told them it was a custom blend they liked because there was some clove in it. And the smell of it, they liked it. And so I told them they could order uh, black duck and be like 80% there. So that's, you ain't got to start from scratch. If you want to try this, go with that. And I had several of them that now contacted me after the thing going that they really like it. And uh, would I give them the recipe for uh, Devil's Play thing? And I got to go back down to those and get that guy and we got to look it up. But if I have you a chance, I'll publish it. But everybody's taste is different. I like harsh stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, how many times have we sat around a, a, a camp at a big event and somebody come up? Remember the guy that one made fun of the little sissy glasses? Oh yeah. The fiddle player. Right. Until he drank Uncle Dog's finest. <laughs> That was more white light than anything else, and then we had to go pour him in his bed because right. two sissy glasses. And he lost gone. his fiddle until I gave it back to him <laughs> two days later. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, he did not understand little glasses like that. But I'd make that Uncle Don Dog's finest, and then I'd run it through twice, and mm -hmm. each time I ran it through, I doubled the content. And he got where it would hurt you. The booze way of. Uh, Southeastern at Tallahassee that wanted to pay us in liquor 
had to come oh, yeah. and renegotiate. Right, had to come up and renegotiate because <laughs> we were breaking the southeastern. <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, let me see, Lulu's husband, Richard, mm -hmm. and Big Money Griff. Mm -hmm. And they got in Uncle Dog's finest one night oh, and yeah. I roamed, warned them. Yeah. And the next morning when we picked them up, both of them didn't have any hide on their nose where they had fell in the dirt and tried to get up all night long. Oh my God. And they uh, stayed away from Uncle Dog's finest. Well, we had that event. I still have all of the newspapers mm -hmm. that we printed, Campfire News. I still got them. With the instructions of how to set up your own steel yes. in your kitchen using, using a pressure, pressure cooker. cooker. Yes. And your wife's lace curtains to strain. Yes. Make sure she's not at home when you strain. When you strain it. Oh yeah. And then came, we were at the spring event up there at Fort Toulouse and you told Big Bunny Griff and Richard about that. And in the fall event, they had run off that stuff. And it had rained, God it had rained. That's when me and David played U boat commander. And that That's thing. right. Y'all's tent went under water. I not saw a, it right off the bat. Not a drop came through the top, but that 200 foot circle held water and it came up four inches deep. Sure, the leaves showed you. They had floated out and there was a circle of leaves. Yeah, there was a bathtub put a rain. tent in here. This is a bathtub. I got an education, that's for a fact. Me and Davy Hobbs. My tent was high and dry. Yeah, but by God, you had camped in that place the, the, in the spring. That's the reason we went back there, because you had camped there that year yeah, before. Yeah, but that, that particular site I hadn't been on, but, but you're right. But I went and looked at the little oak leaves, Yeah. the pattern on the ground. You read the ground. And that's where I put my tent. Yep, that's where it died. Of course, when y'all went and put yours up, I thought, well, if that's what they really want, who am I to argue with? Them? Oh, yeah, you did that chick, 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 chick thing you'd do and walk by, and we didn't know what it was until it went to raining. Oh, my. It, that it was, was just the night up. that all of us were in our tent. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. We had, it had rained all day. It finally yeah, slacked you up. You ate my food that night. Oh, oh, that was the night. Because it was right at sundown, and y'all had got a fire going out outside your tent. And everybody grabbed chairs and ran up there, and we'd only been up there just a few minutes. And that's when Big Money Griff and Richard brought out those mayonnaise jars of that stuff they'd made up. And there was, oh boy, oh crap, and oh fornication we used. And I didn't know it, and I come walking up, and you'd already tasted it. And you're the one who put the name on the things. And I come walking up and Griff said, oh, good, Blackie's here. And he handed me that thing and I took a heaping gulp and didn't know there were three bottles. And they kept handing me a, another one here and I took a heaping gulp. You know, I was young and dumb and stupid. And then the bottom fell out. I saw it right off the bat. And we'd all, there was 17 of us ended up in your wall tent. Yep. Davy Hobbs was sitting on the ground. You were sitting there in your chair, your legs out on your stool, smoking pipe. Uncle your Dog beside me. Uncle Dog was up in your lap, and I'm sitting on your camp box. And 45 minutes to an hour later, suddenly the world started going sideways, and I realized I was getting drunker by the minute, because I had not eaten that day, and I had probably drank half a quart of straight white lightning. Yeah. And so I bowed out and went underneath the side and I went to my tent and I dug out that big old can of, of chili and I opened the lid and I come back under that side and Uncle Dog perked up right there and I went to eating that can with that big old military spoon. Uncle Dog was growling at He was growling and snapping at me and I didn't care. I was hungry. And suddenly the whole tent got quieter and quieter and everybody would shut up. And then whenever I was getting the dregs out of the bottom of that can, you pulled your pipe out and said, Blackie, it takes a strong man to eat Alpo cold like that. And I turned around and looked at the label, it was a can of Alpo. You'd gone halfway around the tent, not down the hill, and you got reached it. into my pack and pulled out a can of Uncle Dog's food. Uncle Dog's Alpo and ate yeah. it. Yeah, he never forgave me for that. that peed on your blankets, He peed he? on my blankets for years after that. 
I had to tie my bedroll up in a tree. If I, laid, if I left it in my diamond, he would come. I was ground pounding back in them days. He would gnaw through the straps and roll it out with his damn nose and pee on it. Pee on it, yeah. He made a point of peeing on my blankets because Boxes I eat his apple. do not forget. He, he did not. Uncle yeah. Dog never forgave me for that. You know, I, I watched you learn some lessons through the years. Mm -hmm. We were camping up on Oak Mountain in February. Cold. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cold. God, a little creek in front of us, mm -hmm. about 15 feet wide, mm -hmm. about three feet deep, and mm -hmm. half frozen over, and that was stream running down the side of a mountain. Mm -hmm. You had gone up the mountain so you could look over everything. Yep, that shelf right, right. up there. I was down there by the creek. And I had not brought me any blankets or anything, and I just dug a hole or two and heated the rock and cut it up with dirt and slept on top of it. Mm -hmm. You thought that was neat. You went and heated your rock. I yep. remember that. Yep, and I put it in the bottom of that sleeping bag, and the damn sleeping bag caught on fire, and the zipper jammed. So I had to come bunny hopping down that rock ledge with an on fire sleeping bag and jump in the creek. You come down that ledge, and you were bunny hopping like you were in a sack race. Yep. And you was hollering, fire, fire! Yeah. Well, it was you on fire. What a lot of people don't realize is we all use military sleeping bags. Yep. And if you zip one all the way to the end, and it's made for combat, the whole bag will fall open. Mm -hmm. Well, when your zipper jammed, you couldn't open it up, and there you were stuck in it, and that rock was too hot and doesn't set them feathers on fire. Yep, so I had burning feathers, and then yeah. it, it was probably 18 degrees, and I jumped in that damn ice-cold creek. And now I got a new problem. Now I'm trapped underwater in a sleeping bag. <laughs> I leaned over and told Swamp Owl, he was camping next to me. Yeah. I said, Rock was too hot, hot. seen it right off the bat. Yep. I come up, I find the bottom gave out, and I managed to kick that rock out, and I wiggled out of that dang tube and stood up in waist deep water, gasping for air, clawed up on that bank, and you're sitting there smoking your pipe, looking at me, going, Well, did you have a good time? God, I wanted to throttle you. Oh, yeah. boy. But now, in your defense, you didn't say a word. Y'all just built the fire up. You went and grabbed an extra shirt you had to give me, so I had to strip and re-dry out everything. Yeah. And we sat there and had coffee for me and kept me going that night. Well, you are in the same shape I was. I didn't have a blanket with me. Mm -hmm. I'd gone off and left them at home, so... I just slept on top of hot rocks all night. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then the and a breech clout. The next year was whenever, remember, the ranger came up there at dark and told us that he was going to leave the the building open for us because it was going to be cold, cold that night, and he thought we might need to get out of the weather. And that was the night all the water froze in Birmingham and all the pipes froze except for that 100-year-old cabin on top of the mountain. And we were the only ones who had coffee. <laughs> we were in heavy blankets and we were good. I was in a teepee that year. That's right. Squire and I slept together. Yep. That was the year I introduced him to sausage gravy. And you know, we really should have just called him instead of Squire. We should have just called him Central Heat. Because by God, oh, yeah, he, he wanted would, a fire. He would stoke a fire better than anybody I've ever seen. He chopped wood. It was so so cold mm -hmm. that all the cabins did freeze, mm -hmm. and all the toilets busted in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were still going there, which amazed everybody. Mm -hmm. And he had chopped so much wood, and he put it all the way around our teepee on the inside. That's 16 foot TP. That's 48 foot of wood, yeah. two feet high, split. At least he, two cords. Right. <laughs> he did not want to get cold. No. And I'd climb up in my my bed and I slept just in a t shirt, and he could not understand that I knew how to stay warm out there. I, mm -hmm. But you know, and you got to, to be honest, if y'all ask me a question, I would honestly answer it. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't ask me, 
I figured you wanted to learn by experience. You wanted to learn. And I'd watch. And I remember one time, Doc Critter Craner mm -hmm. was putting up a teepee. Oh, God, yeah. And you were going to go help him. And I said, Blackie, I wouldn't do that. If I, I wouldn't do you. that. So you came over and sat down, and we watched Critter get madder and madder and madder until finally he said a dirty word. Yes. Which is unusual for a bishop. It, it really was. And then we got up and had everything fixed in about five minutes for him because I'd been putting up teepees since I was 12 years old. Well, he was such a perfectionist, he would get the whole thing together and there'd be a wrinkle. And he'd tear it back down to adjust poles to eliminate that wrinkle. It didn't matter. It wasn't going to hurt nothing that it had a wrinkle, but he didn't care. Well, I, I, how many times, was it six or eight times he put the cover on? Oh, he got mad. He'd take it all the way down and adjust his poles and put the cover back on and stake it all together and then there'd be a wrinkle. Mine, and it used to aggravate him that mine would come out right every time. Mm -hmm. Well, he put it up four times a year. Mm -hmm. I put mine up all the time. But the same way we're making a fire. Mm -hmm. We were up there at Toulouse, it was raining. It was raining. Mm -hmm. It had rained. Mm -hmm. And I got up in the morning, built a fire, and was cooking. Mm -hmm. And Doc John and them just were not going to ask me to use my fire. The magic woofa woofa machine or the fire, yes. All right. You remember, you got me. By God, you set me up. We were yeah, up there to Toulouse, and... Of course, you got the Coosa and the Tallapoosa. And this side of camp is the Coosa. And it was calm, beautiful. It's just a, it's, it's a slow-moving lake. Well, it ran down to a dam. Right. And so it wasn't going nowhere. But now the Tallapoosa, she... She was at flood stage. Right. She had rumbled. And y'all had a canoe. You remember we'd put y'all in and y'all had floated around to there. And it was down that 70-foot bank. And so me and Davey Hobbs are sitting there, and you came up, and you went, Blackie, how would you and Dave like to use my canoe for a little bit? I need it to run around to the boat dock on the other side. How would y'all like to do that? So, oh, yeah, me and Davey, we were puppy dogs. We were ready to go. So you and Squire with a rope lowered us down there, and we got in that canoe, and it was like floating on glass. And we hit... It was and, only about three or four miles float. Yeah, that's Make all it was. At, 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 to, at top, <laughs> three miles tops. But when we ran at the corner, the Tallapoosa was at flood stage and running full speed. And we were playing Hawaii Five O, stroking as hard as we could. And we'd just barely make inches to just run out of breath. And then we'd grab a hold of the bank. Well, four hours later, I went over there to meet y'all and take the canoe out. And that was just as we were pulling up to the boat landing. We centered that thing. We flopped out onto the grass, gasping for air, totally exhausted. And you said, thank you, boys. Threw it on the truck, grabbed the paddle, and you were gone. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. Yeah. We learned never to volunteer to take the paddle around the other side without going and checking first either. Oh, it was an adventure. I've, I've talked to Davey about that several times. And he had got into a kind of a tight situation. He had called me up and was talking about it. He said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this. I said, bull crap. We were on the Tallapoosa at flood stage, dude, <laughs> where we were going to drown or we were going to make it. So don't give me that. We've done being at the Tallapoosa. And he went laughing. He said, yeah, that's right. I, many times he'd look back and he'd think how bad it was. And said, I remember watching my life pass before my eyes on the Tallapoosa. Because yeah. if we went in, we were gone. And there was no bank. Too steep a bank to come up on that side. So we were just paddling for life. Well, you find out what you're made of when it's all against you. Mm -hmm. You don't find out when it's easy. Mm -mm. And if you're going to amount to anything in life, treasure adversity. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. It teaches you the most. It'll teach you the most. I'll... It has taught me, uh, it's like going in the military. Mm -hmm. You might not find out what you want to do in life, but you'll find out a hundred things you don't want to do. Bingo. It narrows it down. I'm... 
an honor you gave me one time to hurt somebody's feelings. I won't call no names, but the creek was running kind of high, and there was a, a log, a tree you wanted to cut out on Pigeon Creek, and it was running kind of high, and we were having one of our campouts down there, and this, you said you wanted to go and cut that out, and he volunteered to go with you, and you tried to be nice about it to finally have to tell him you didn't want him, you wanted me to go with you, because mm -hmm. it was going to be that bad. Sure. And he wasn't, he wouldn't be able to handle it. And you didn't want to have to rescue him. And so you had to hurt his feelings and tell him, I want Blackie to go with me, not you. Yeah, because we that. cut that out with an axe. Yeah. And then we got it down enough where the, the current of the creek broke it in half. And we had, it was high water. We, up. we yeah. came down that thing at high speed. And I knew something was up. You know, you were in the back, me in the front. And then we turned it around and I'm facing upstream and held it so you could get off and do what you got to do. And I had to keep that canoe right there because there was nothing tied up. And so I kept us there where you got out and cut it loose. And then the current, like I say, Kurt took it. Heck, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, we couldn't even find the log. It was gone. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I remember that. That was that was a real honor to me that you wanted me with you on that and not him. So. Well... One of the finest compliments you ever gave me was in front of a lot of people I respect. You said that Blackie's a fair to Midland woodsman. That was one of the best compliments you ever gave me. Well, I lived and worked in 51 countries. I did the Arctic. I never did the Antarctic, but I did the Arctic several times. Mm -hmm. Mountains, tundra, jungles, and each one has got their own environment. And what a lot of people don't realize is the environment is not against you and it's not for you. Yep. You have to make do. So I, as you know, all my books show, I studied the environments of the world, mm -hmm. what I had to do to live there, be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, it didn't take long to adjust to it. Mm -hmm. One of the knives I have in this cabinet right here behind me I went to JESCU, Jungle Environmental Survival Techniques in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and it's run by the Negritos, and at that time I was the survival officer for 1st Marine Air Wing in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I went there to check on our pilots and what they were going through, and I stayed with the Negritos for two weeks up there in the mountains, and when I left, they gave me one of their knives as an honor present because I fit in with them. Mm -hmm. Whether it was eating local game or monkey or whatever. Mm -hmm. And their knives were all made out of truck springs with... Uh, Real working knives. Yeah, with buffalo scales for handles, you mm -hmm. know. It wasn't for pretty, it was for working. Yep. Can't sharpen my damn thing. <laughs> Steel yeah. is so hard, but yeah. it's, it's up there. Once you get it sharp, it's going to stay sharp. But for a long it. time. Long time. It was like a buck knife. Oh, I never God. cared for a buck knife. Yes. Because they were like a razor. And one day when they weren't like a razor, they were just so hard to sharpen. So I had one. Used it a couple of times and realized what I was up against and let it go, you know. I got an A in auto mechanics in high school because of buck knives. I had been there three days and they're doing the orientation, they're showing you the equipment and all like that. The guy who, guy's name was Barnes, that ran the class and he was doing something and he needed a knife and so I pulled out my lock back and handed it to him and he cut it and then he felt dead and he said, who sharpened the knife? And I said, I did. And he said, you, you sharpen knives? And I said, yeah. And he pulled out a buck knife out of his pocket that was about as blunt as a brick and gave it to me and said, here, sharpen this one. Well, they had a three-axis valve machine. And I turned it on. I got that valve grinder running. I could by hand had to find enough touch. I put a bevel on it and I edged it. And then I took my belt off and wrapped it around my leg and I stropped it and got it where it would shave hair. 20 minutes, I handed it to him. Well, I didn't know that he had bought somewhere from a gun shop that had gone out, but Buck used to sell an entire wall display that was one of every model they made. 
the big belt knife, pocket knives, everything. But none of them were sharp. They're all blunt because it's a wall display. And I spent the entire year in that class doing nothing but sharpening knives in that class. I had an uh, old footlocker I kept in the, his office that had all my sharpening gear on it for files and vices and everything to put bevels on them. And uh, I would come in, everybody else would go out in the bay and start working on cars, and I would sharpen knives. And I got an A in auto mechanics for sharpening knives. I think I turned wrenches three days in that whole class. The only two that I've ever bought to put a bevel on an edge is I bought a set of rollers to bevel my wood chisels because yeah. they have to be at an exact 30 degree angle and I could take them and put it on that and run it on my stone and get a perfect bevel. Mm -hmm. Still have it, of course, almost don't ever throw anything away, I guess. I'm a hoarder. I give a lot of stuff away. Mm -hmm. I've given away books, guns, things that I thought people would be interested in, care about. Now, which do you prefer for a canoe paddle? Bent, like, straight, or what? Oh, I like a straight one. Because, uh, number one, I always sit in the stern. Yeah. And to steer, I don't need a bent paddle. Yeah. I like maybe if bent. I was up front and I was providing manpower stroke. Provision, uh, propulsion, yeah. yeah. Now, a bent paddle there, but I've never done that. I've always been in the start. I've canoed through Alaska, canoed down through Mississippi, canoed in Central and South America, mm -hmm. a little bit in Africa. And the Carolinas. And the Carolinas. Up in, the back, up in that area. Made my own canoes. Well, I had a bent paddle for a while, and I really liked it. But I would take my canoe, the spit kit, and I'd turn it around so I'm sitting in the bow facing backwards, putting it more in the center of the canoe. And that's my favorite way to do it. it get me away from the exact stern and a little more center of balance because I like to pivot with my hips as opposed to just, you know, turn the whole battleship, so to speak. I found it was easier for me. And so I like a bent paddle. I have never had a beaver tail, that long, narrow one. Mm -hmm. That's what I use. I, I knew you, you used them a lot, mm -hmm. but I've never had one. And I thought about getting one. Now I've got the age, I'm not, to, not toting packs like I did. And I'm doing more car camping. And uh, I promised my readers that a lot of them asked me about it, I'm going to start going back and finish fishing. In fact, I went out this weekend with Dakota and brought out the fly rods. And uh, Dakota was running a four-foot leader, and I had an eight-foot leader on it. And I remember at one point you had a 12-foot leader on it. Sure. Oh, good God. And he said, good God, why so long? And I said, why so short? Which I was, the fly fishing I've learned has been around you because I was taught splat fishing, which is cane pole fishing but with a, a reel. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember you had such a long leader on it, and... I was shorter, I was like eight foot, but now that I'm looking at him, I've never really studied that much about the official fly fishing, because it's mostly about out west and, you know, brookies. And I've never done that. Mine's always been for for brim and bass in the uh -huh. southeast. Yeah, and that's me. And that's what I found worked. My little, never used any weight. Uh, if I was casting with worms, which I did sometimes, mm -hmm. with a fly rod, I could not whip it, but generally put it out there. And mm -hmm. That 12 foot leader, the fish can't see it at all, and mm -hmm. that worm slowly settles to the bottom. Or, and here I am, here I am. And, yeah, and, and catch bass and brim, that's what we got down here. But. And I'd use the eight, eight foot leader with popping bugs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That's what we, I was playing with was a yellow popping blood plug as the rain would dissipate. There's nothing to catch and fish with a fly rod. Uh -uh. You just throw it out there and you just <laughs> jump on it and you pull them in. Oh yeah, don't even worry about it. It's just jumping in, right. beaver jumping in the trap tail. Just hold yeah, up take me, or take me. Yeah. 20 or 25 brim and maybe a bass or two. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the thing yeah. got me is how well you could do it out of a canoe. When we went to the Delta that time fishing, 
and I could fish out of a canoe with one, and did. But the thing about it is, is I swear to God, it's like your canoe would just become a rigid fixture on the horizon that wouldn't move, and you're sitting there just so gently flipping. I'm fighting current, fighting canoe, fighting everything, trying to cast. Well, that's because I had a five-pound weight I pulled over the back, and I was dragging through the And water. I didn't know that, and <coughs> here I am wondering how he'd get his I canoe I thought everybody still. knew that. No. The canoe going straight against uh -uh. the wind. And no, here I am, you know, struggling, trying to keep the canoe in position. You'd sit the paddle down, pick up the, about the time you draw it back, now you're sideways to the current. It was just, it was a frustration city. I just never understood that. Yeah, right. You did enjoy watching it though, I can remember that. Same way with you turning your canoe around and sitting in... Backwards in it. Right. All I did was take a three gallon bucket and fill it up with wet sand and put it in the front. Yeah. And it kept my canoe almost perfect and Trim. I could stay in the back where I could just lean over the side real easy and skull with one hand and take the fly rod and work both sides of the stream with the other hand. Remember we had, I put my spare tire in that canoe. We didn't have any sand, we couldn't, it was all swamp around there. And uh, we had intended to do that, and I did not have any weight to put in the bow of that canoe, and it kept rearing up because it had more of a tumble home to it. And so I went and... Uh, I put mud in my butt.